Now our next speaker uh, has something in common, sadly, with Patrice as well. Patrice lost her brother, and the next speaker, Gordon, has recently lost her brother as well. Um, and um, this is Gordon's first time speaking, I think. Um, so um, I came across Gordon um, a few years ago there as well at the Hearing uh, the Pretty Good Voices Network Conference in UCC, which is held every November and is on again this year. Uh, and got to know him very well. Um, there's a lot of work as well on Facebook, knows his stuff well, and is also in a very practical manner helped to find Freedom Ireland with our new. <coughs> Revamped website which uh, we're in the operation or whatever. So, Gordon, thank you so
Um, and one of the most obvious human abuses within the profession uh, is the infamous the boss. I think it's fair to ask why does society still trust these people uh, with safeguarding people's uh, emotional and mental well-being. Um, psychiatry uh, fails to be scientific in that it doesn't have verifiable, repeatable results. For instance, with diagnosis and with the medication, um, which is given in a haphazard uh, type of a way. And then let's see what happens uh, approach. Um, and it has this, that has the side effect of making you feel like a guinea pig, which I guess, um, research probably shows you, you, you are. Um, it also fails to be objective. Uh, they reach their decisions by looking at behaviour, which is uh, which involves a huge degree of interpretation. Why I'm acting a way, and why uh, they think I'm acting that way, could be completely different. Like a, an example of that is uh, in my health files, I saw that they said that I heard voices. I never once heard voices, but I remember uh, the incident, and it was a. a um, but I can't remember exactly what I was saying, but it was about the Iraq war and I was taking the, the opposing viewpoint. So I was like, right, you say it. <laughs> and they thought I was talking to a person, but I was talking to the counter argument. <laughs> um, there are no objective facts other than um, the unusual behaviour. That's the only objective thing that, uh, that they actually determine. Um, that they make their uh, their diagnosis from, and the labels only classify behaviour, and that they do badly. Like uh, an example of autism, where two different people can be have complete and utter different kind of ways of behaving. Uh, one being functional, the other being not so functional. Um, and also, if you change your behaviour, the label is removed, so it looks at the worst. Uh, years of your life and not the best. The labels are simply voted in and out of existence by uh, psychiatrists without any evidence. Um, it also fails to have rigorous research. Uh, much of the research is sponsored by drug companies and the psychiatrists having ghost written research and uh, drug, the drug companies uh, skewing the, res the results with uh, pre trials and other methods. They also fail to have an open mind, which is essential to science. Uh, psychiatry has always presumed the brain is the mind, is, is behaviour brilliant, and not the reverse. You could possibly uh, change your brain by changing your behaviour, and they don't seem to consider that. If psychiatry was truly scientific, it would have an open mind, but it can't afford to be, because otherwise uh, I think it would cease to exist. They also fail medically. Psychiatrists do harm. Um, there are no Ill there are no mental illness tests to pass or fail, which, as far as I know, is unlike any other uh, field of medicine. Uh, yet they maintain the biochemical evidence uh, uh, fiction, or they maintain the fiction of biochemical evidence for, for illness. Psychiatrists also systematically destroy hope. Their different definition of recovery being one of the tools they use to do this. They do not use the medical definition for recovery, which is something on the lines of a return to a normal state of health, mind and strength. <coughs> the importance of psychiatry failing uh, by its own criteria uh, can't be underestimated. Science and medicine are held by society to be practically irrefutable. They can only be really, they can only really be contested by further science and medicine. So, if people mistakenly believe that psychiatry, psychiatry to be both medical <coughs> and scientific, then that lends their statements weight that it doesn't deserve. Other things that some people might find useful, such as Reiki, art therapy, or counselling, do not claim to be scientific but may work better. However, they are not lent the gravitas of medicine and science. Returning to the definition of reco recovery, 
Rather than uh, using recovery as a return to normal state of health, mind, or strength, they use this one. Recovery is a deeply personal, unique experience of changing one's attitudes, values, feelings, goals, skills, and roles. It is a way of living a satisfying, hopeful, and contributing life, even with the limitations caused by illness. Recovery involves the development of new meaning and purpose in one's life as one grows beyond the catastrophic effects of mental illness. And that's from a guide for consultants and rehab, which was taken from the Psychiatrist Department website. So what's the problem with this? Well, for me, the problem, like with the first sentence, a deeply personal. If it's deeply personal, it's subjective. If it's unique, it's non-repeatable. But in one sense, that uh, first paragraph, a deeply personal, unique a process of changing one's attitudes, values, feelings, goals, skills and roles, that's kind of like growing. That's what a five-year-old does. They, they go from there to an adult and they have all that stuff happening. So in a psychological way, that's true. It, it, is, uh, um, it is part of recovery, but these are the people who are talking about mental illness, the objective thing, mental illness. So they should, they should be using the medical definition for recovery. Um, and it's, it's also uh, completely unscientific, you can't really measure, uh, well I don't think you could measure that very easily, those things. The second sentence is vague in that it says uh, that you need to have a satisfying, hopeful and contributing life. So if we're going to look at it like, do you need all three, and if you only have one or two, it does that mean you haven't recovered? But worst of all, it says, even with the limitations caused by illness, let me remind you, this is the definition of recovery, and rather than refer to health, it refers to illness. The last sentence is another half-truth. Recovery involves the development of new meaning and purpose in one, one's life as one grows. Okay, beyond the catastrophic effects of mental illness. What are they? Because I don't know what they are to this day. So, the very definitions contained within the references to an illness rather than to health, like I said, uh, the psychiatrists do as if their branding uh, us with the label is an objective thing, as if they've diagnosed us in a scientific way, but they only want to allow us to recover in a subjective way. And for somebody who never thought they were ill in the first place, that means I shouldn't have ever actually been ill, but I am, in the, in, as, as far as the uh, states is concerned. <coughs> Um, and yeah, so like this charade is uh, of legitimacy, is supported at this stage because I think, uh, as far as I know, if I'm brought to court or something uh, to give evidence, my, my mind can, state of mind can be forever more called into question. Um, so, as I, as I pointed to, psychiatrists assume that there is a physical, biological cause for mental health problems. If we instead presume the exact opposite, that mental health problems stem from everything but biology, then not only do we vote to cars to save our job, but uh, we also open up Pandora's box. If we instead, for a moment, allow ourselves to open up to the idea that mental health problems are emotional, existential, or spiritual, then the contributing factors could include things such as family, society, environment, or anything else that affects our emotions or makes us wonder what the point of it all is. What psychiatrists may see as early childhood signs of schizophrenia, I see. I see the signs of emotional obsession within the family. My childhood and that of my siblings was difficult. My parents separated at a time in Ireland when that was very unusual. There were dramatic fights and lots of instability. One thing I remember, that I particularly remember as distressing, was my father's alcoholic intervention, where family members told him how much he was drinking and how it affected them. Um, his mother did not accept us at first. 
but broke down crying the following week. And I remember thinking that she was such a hard-nosed woman and being like really shocked that she'd even cry. I, I, my granddad, I, I have seen crying easier than her. I don't know what age it was, it was probably around nine or something, but either way, I was 14 to be surrounded by all those heavy emotions uh, in, in an environment that I saw as kind of almost attacking my father. And, you know, even though I had a whole love hate thing going on there too. But then, um, <coughs> I have two older sisters and two, young, two younger brothers, or at least did have. Um, the nearest of my sisters is five years older than I am. And they experienced a completely different upbringing to that of myself and my two younger brothers. Most of the, of the fights, I think, happened uh, when I was between kind of seven and thirteen. So my sister would have been between thirteen and nineteen. So it's quite a difference to experience those that, that dramatic kind of uh, stuff happening as as a, a young age or an older age. It's hardly surprising to me that all my brothers. And I struggled to some extent with our emotional well-being. I remember too when I was first in hospital reading a pamphlet that stated schizophrenia is not caused by bad families. And I recall wondering, how the hell do you know that? <laughs> what exactly is a bad family? What families claim to be bad and how would you know if they claim that they're good? It was not just the family uh, the, where I had the emotional difficulties. During all the upsets at home, I was also bullied at school. I went to a private school, but did not have the means to keep up with the Joneses. Part of the slagging was because I did not fit comfortably into their social class. My schoolwork suffered greatly too. It was only due to one teacher that I found a love of maths and science, as she kept me back and always believed I was clever. What did I do to myself too? Eventually, I dropped out of school. Then I went back to do the leaving cert and took up smoking cannabis at the same time. I, I then uh, did the leaving cert yeah, the second time I went to college. And went, like, while well, some might put uh, my dropping out of college down to uh, smoking too much hash and drinking too much, I put it down to not feeling intelligent having a, a low self-worth and not feeling I fit in and also not imagining myself as a working professional and uh, like which was why I was drinking and smoking and um, when I did drop out of college I became severely depressed I had no direction in life uh, I was also not offered any help but in retrospect that was probably a good thing because I'd probably be dead if I got help that is offered um, I couldn't concentrate and I couldn't see the point of life. I spent a few months being homeless as well during the summer, but I didn't really care because I was just all over the place. <laughs> um, eventually then I did a thought to get my life back together and that I'd do a false course and become a computer expert. But despite being the best uh, programmer in the class, I couldn't get a job. And that's probably because I didn't have uh, people skills and you know they could see that I wasn't quite there, wasn't quite stable enough. Simply put, I experienced an emotional crisis, which led to an existential crisis, and I think the same was true of my brother Graham. I witnessed his childhood. I witnessed his childhood. I know the hurt and pain that he went through, and in some ways it was worse than mine. He was gentle. He was... I'm okay. It's okay. Right. No, it's okay. I'm okay. I want to go on. Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> he, he was a gentle sort of kid, and I was too. But I'm also a strong fighter when I need to be. In recent years, I saw what he was going through and knew to an extent what it feels like. I was not surprised that he hung himself, although I was still quite angry at him. For having done so. 
and for having hung himself on my mother's property. I found it difficult to understand that he believed in his label and that he'd come on and off medication despite my warnings. And he'd, he, he would say, my brain is damaged and I knew that that came from the psychiatric model and from, from even from the alternative models that are there. And when he'd say that, I'd get annoyed because I knew there was no evidence and I've met brain damaged people. Brain damaged people weren't able to do, weren't actually able to do the things that he was able to do. He was a very proficient drummer and very good uh, with woodwork. Um, but he didn't see the value of any of the skills he had. He did not seem to want to get better. He did not, he, he also didn't see my journey as being any. Um, cause of hope, but then he was always in my shadow, so. But, and it, but the hurt and the anger from our childhood and the social, social isolation we felt within a city of millions, the drugs we took and the lack of direction we had, that was effectively irrelevant to psychiatrists, or at least of minor importance. For me, the journey through madness was a difficult one but a valuable one, and one that I would not change for the world. If I had not experienced those difficulties, I wouldn't be who I am today, wherever the hell that is. Perhaps I uh, would be in negative equity, or worse, wealthy and unsatisfied like a hungry ghost. Mary and Jim hit the nail on the head here. When, uh, when they refer to saving our souls. For me, what the psychiatrists call psychosis, I think more in terms of an intense spiritual event that changed my life for the better. Um, like when I was in uh, like the first uh, uh, psychosis that I had, I stood in front, in, in front of what I saw as the universe going, uh, please, you know, show me you're here, bam. And for me, that moment, okay, however crazy and mad, I knew it was crazy and mad, however crazy and mad, I didn't care, I just, that really, uh, feeling, the, feeling um, I was reading a, a brief history of time at the time, and um, thinking about future, past, now, and uh, infinity, and things like that, and we're all the center of infinity, and Okay, we, we might know this, but I feel I really felt it that way. And in the depths of my, of my soul, I still struggle with our sham of a democracy and being looked upon as an economic unit rather than a person. My journey has always been like that 1976 movie, Network, opening the window and shouting at the top of my lungs, I'm mad as hell! I'm not going to take it anymore. But, but unlike in the film, others are not doing the same. Ah, sure, they're only trying their best. It's, it's the basic mantra. In my view, it is the moral of us all to mask over the complexity of mental health with a simplistic, unproven science of genetics, biochemistry, and other biological fictions. And by redefining, uh, by redefining recovery, the mental illness system has robbed me of a word I need to describe my journey through that abyss of madness and to differentiate myself from the current service users who regularly attend psychiatrists, <coughs> take medication and believe in their uh, labels. It means that future statistics will be meaningless because we can, no long, we can, we can only ask do you feel better? But we can never ask, are you better? Have you got the all clear? The redefinition of recovery allows psychiatrists to use the double speak of recovery equals illness and to confuse the concept of feeling okay on drugs with getting better. It robs us of the very idea of the possibility of regaining, and, uh, of regaining fully and completely our emotional, spiritual and mental capacities there are many of us who have made full and complete recoveries, 
But by redefining the word into meaningless, meaninglessness, psychiatrists seek to undermine that journey. That is why I feel it is true to say that psychiatrists' redefining of recovery robs us of our success. Thanks.